One day in 2012, I was scrolling through Facebook, and the Facebook gods decided that I would see this post from an old friend of mine named Julia. And we hadn't seen each other in years. We had drifted off to social media acquaintances. And this post of hers started, I'm dying. I'm dying from kidney failure. All of my loved ones, my friends and family, have already tried to donate to me, and they've been rejected, so this is literally my last resort. I'm posting on Facebook to see if anyone I'm connected to on here would be willing to donate a kidney to me. I dropped everything. I messaged Julia. I said, I'm so sorry that we lost touch. I didn't even know you were sick. Absolutely, I'm willing to look into this for you. So I don't know if you guys know this, but it's really difficult to be approved to donate a kidney. They basically run every test you could possibly run on a human being, including really intense psychological exams. If they find one thing wrong with you, they say no, which is why over 100 of Julia's friends and family had already been rejected. But I was lucky, and I got approved. But Julia and I, as a pair, we're not as lucky. So we were not compatible, and I could not directly give my kidney to her. So we entered into this really cool thing called the National Kidney Swap Registry, and it's filled with these incompatible donor-recipient pairs, like me and Julia, right? So somebody who wants to give their kidney to their loved one but can't, and so they enter into this computer algorithm that tries to figure out, like, who could you give your kidney to that further down this swap chain, your friend could get one, right? And so the computer's sitting there trying to figure out, right, how can we do this? And at the very last minute, Julia's mother, who had been rejected originally for a small medical issue, had gotten cleared for donation. And the computer loved Julia's mother. It was like, excellent. As soon as she entered in with Julia into the computer system, it figured out immediately this chain that would work out with she and her. So my kidney wasn't needed. And so I got to step back and watch my friend Julia. And she got to get this kidney transplant. And her life totally changed. Every time I saw her, she was a newer, happier person. And then a year passed, and she got pregnant. She had a baby. And I swear to God, the moment I saw a picture of this child, it was such a no-brainer for me. I was like, this life, right, this new life, life. It only exists because someone was willing to donate their kidney to my friend Julia. And every life that that baby grows up to touch, right, only exists because of this one choice. And I had already done this, like, mental and emotional gymnastics when I had prepared to donate to her, right? And now that I knew how difficult it was, how long the wait list was, and that I could do it, I just couldn't justify not doing it for someone else. So I called the hospital, and I said, this time, I want to donate to a stranger. And so they entered me into that same computer system, but this time they called me a non-directed or Good Samaritan donor. And as you can imagine, this computer system is very complex. It's very difficult for what they call a closed loop to happen, so that every pair right, in the loop somehow perfectly matches with someone else in the loop. right? Most times they need an outside person, a Good Samaritan person who's like, I'll give my kidney to anybody, right? Kidney for you, kidney for you, like Oprah, right? And so, like, it was amazing for the computer for me to enter in as a non-directed donor because it was like, awesome, you know, we could take you, you can give your kidney to this person in Ohio, and their incompatible donor can give their kidney to this person in San Diego, and their incompatible donor can give their kidney to this person in Charleston, and so forth and so on. So after my testing, like, it was done. Within six weeks, I was going to have this surgery, and I was going to kick off a chain of 16 surgeries that would pull eight people <laughs> off of the wait list. What an honor, right? And I had this really interesting, like, internal battle. Like, do I tell people about this, right? Like, I had to tell my mom, the nurse, she was going to come up and be my caretaker. And I had to tell my best friends. But outside of this circle, I wasn't sure who I should share this with, because it's, it's, it's weird, y'all. It's weird, right? I'm giving my kidney to a stranger. Um, and also, like, I, I was worried that people would think I had this weird hero complex or that, like, look at me, I'm so amazing. I give kidneys to strangers. Um, so I decided to keep it more or less a secret um, for the six weeks leading up to this surgery, and that was a, a bad move. So as we got closer to the surgery, when it became like a week before my surgery, I was kind of losing it thinking about all of the risks, and I didn't have this support network to help me through this. I was thinking like, what if I'm one of those rare cases who dies on the operating table? What if my kidney dies on the runway on its way to Ohio, right? And I did all of this for nothing. What if I get older and someone I love, right, a husband, a, a, a child, like, needs a kidney and I've already given mine away to John Doe, right? What if my one kidney fails despite all of these tests and, and I, you know, need a new one? And, and so, like, it's leading up to the surgery and I, at one point I was having a panic attack about it 
and I started frantically cleaning my apartment. <laughs> And I found this bag of clothes that I had shoved into a closet to get tailored, you know, one day. And I jump on Yelp to find a local tailor, and there's one that works right down the street from me, and her name is Brunhilde. I'm like, this is perfect, <laughs> right? So I call her a thick German accent, as she's available right now. I grab the bag, I start walking toward her house. I get to her apartment, she opens the door, she looks exactly the way you think she looks, like giant German woman, huge boobs, right? I start pulling out the clothes from the bag to explain to her what I need done, and she cuts me off. She goes, honey, what's wrong? <laughs> and my bottom lip starts trembling. I go, oh, Brunhilde, I'm donating a kidney on Thursday, and I'm so scared. <laughs> and she just grabs me. She, like, shoves my face into those giant boobs, starts pawing my back. She goes, honey, you are doing a wonderful thing. <laughs> and it was like... It was, this, it was this beautiful moment where this absolute stranger, right, was giving me exactly the kind of comfort that I so desperately needed, and I decided on the walk home from Brunhilde's house, I have to tell people about this. And so I posted, and of course, you know, immediately the outpouring of love and support so bolstered me, and Brunhilde and I decided on purpose that I would come pick up my clothes the night before the surgery, and she opened the door and she says, honey, you look good. <laughs> Last week, not so good. This week, you look good. <laughs> and my mom flew in that night, and we were sitting on my bed across from each other and holding hands, and I'm not even a religious person, but she said this prayer of safety over me, and I just felt this sense of calm. And I started telling her about the panic attack and about how easy it was, right, in 2012 with Julia, because anytime I got nervous, I would just look at my dying friend and be like, ah, of course, like, of course I'm going to do this for her. But this time I'm sending my kidney into the ether, mom, like Ohio, you know? And she goes, Christine, you have to give these people faces. You have to give them names. And I did. I, we came up with this haven together where I would close my eyes and I would turn the corner into this Barcelona plaza that had a fountain and this tree that was raining orange flowers. And I would imagine these eight people waiting around the fountain for me to do this thing for them. And I rolled into that operating room the next day, having never been more sure of anything in my life. But I am not here to lie to you either. <laughs> and that was hard. <laughs> and the first couple days after surgery were so, so hard. And my mom was just this rock next to me. She slept in the hospital room. She didn't leave me for five days. And on the third day after my surgery, when they took my dilated IV out, and they tried to replace it with a pill, and my stomach couldn't handle it. And I threw up all over myself. And I said, Mom, I don't want to regret this. And she said, you won't regret this, Christine, I promise. And she was so right. And when they took my catheter out and I could take a shower, and I was so excited about it, it was my mom who walked me to that shower, and she took my clothes off. And then she took her clothes off, and she got into the shower and closed the curtains. And she bathed me so gently. She said, Christine, it's just like when you were a baby. A month after this donation, the National Kidney Registry called me and they said, Christine, that chain that you started is still going. It is 56 surgeries long. Your one decision pulled 28 people off of that wait list. And I thought, like, that's more people than can ever fit around that fountain. <laughs> and they said, this is the longest chain we've had in years. We want you to come speak at our gala. And I said, absolutely on one condition, that I can bring my mom. Thank you.